Well, thank you. I hope I'm not going to bug you too much. That's uh, not quite true. Well, I am going to talk about insects. I'm going to talk about wasps particularly. Um, my interest is uh, basically the behavior, the analysis or the study of uh, uh, behavior in uh, solitary wasps. Now, I came to Hong Kong about 15 years ago, and I was absolutely amazed by the diversity or the biodiversity of this city. Uh, we live in a concrete jungle, but outside here, not far away from here, just go five minutes outside Quarry Bay, and you get amazing life crawling all over the place. Um, now, uh, you might want to ask yourself why I would do this. I mean, why would I study bugs in particular? Well, there aren't any uh, major reasons why uh, I want to do this. There's no particular rational explanation apart from the fact that I am interested in bugs. Uh, but the reality is that we have so far probably described less than 30% of all insect species on this planet. So for an amateur like me, trotting into this field of uh, rel relatively un unspoiled uh, territory is uh, very exciting and sometimes very rewarding as well. Uh, my intent here today is to share with you uh, my th current thoughts, thoughts on insects, uh, all derived from my personal observations. Uh, and to basically bring that into the context of uh, our position or that of life on this planet, the planet considered as a huge mega living organism. So uh, where the question is, and we'll bring about this uh, uh, ultimate question, is how do we fit uh, us human beings with regards to our planet? Uh, I don't know if I have the answer, I don't know if anybody has the answer, but uh, it's a question that we'll leave open for, for the continuity. Um, now, our perception of insects is very much a matter of, um, of basically cultural, irrational, uh, subjective uh, feelings. Uh, and very often, uh, I mean, basically, if I show you an image, images like that, I'm sure many of you will quiver with horror, so how disgusting it is. But if I show you images like these, where you have at the top here uh, uh, a queen wasp sheltering after a long day's work, or hatchlings of a, um, a sting bug, or another wasp here taking care of a brood, your perception might change. Uh, perception is also very much dictated by what mass media feeds us. Uh, and it's, in most cases, or until recently, uh, insects were considered as antagonists, basically uh, organisms that were bent in destroying our way of life. Uh, and that was basically fueled by a series of movies like those, uh, which actually came, the reason for these movies were pretty obvious. It was the Cold War period. There was an enemy out there, uh, unknown, unperceived, and not really understood. Uh, but there was also a, a reality of, of basically fire ants, these nasty little ants that came from South America and invaded the southern states of North America, creating havoc, actually, economical havoc. So these films have a sort of a, a social political origin. Uh, but recently, we've turned towards basically a more anthropomorphic aspects or uh, uh, approach to insects. And we've had a series of films like Bugs Life or Ants, which uh, tend to represent insects more like human beings. Uh, whether it's exclusion, whether it's antagonism, whether it's anthropomorphism, I mean, none of this is really true. Uh, the reality is that actually insects are, we like it or not, are, have an indisputed dominance over this planet. Uh, they have been around for many, many years, actually many million years, uh, 150 or 200 million years. Uh, and one of the reasons for that is their great diversity. And this diagram shows you uh, basically proportionally the number of species of insects relatively to the other realms. Now, if you add insects with other arthropods like spiders or, or crustaceans, then you have about 70% of all living organisms are creepy crawly bugs, okay? So we have to get used to it, and there's nothing we can do about it. They've been around. They haven't destroyed us so far. And I think it's just going to go on like that forever. Uh, another reason for their incredible uh, uh, dominance is their uh, ability to reproduce at rates which are absolutely unmeasurable. I mean, uh, for instance, if you take a couple of aphids, these tiny little green bugs that infest rose plants, if you take the offsprings of these uh, one single couple of aphids and you let, let them unchecked uh, by environmental factor, they will cover the planet Earth with a thick layer of 153 kilometers of aphids. So basically, one year, 153 kilometers, we are dwarfed. Uh, and the other reason of their dominance is actually their biomass, the mass that they do represent. If you take all the ants from the Amazon forest, you drive them and you weigh it, that weight will represent four times that of all land vertebrates. So at the end of the day, uh, they are dominant. We like it or not, that's a real fact. Uh, what interests me particularly is basically, as I said earlier in my introduction, is uh, the behavior of insects. Uh, we have basically 
of, 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 so of wasps, basically. We have two, two, two extremes. Uh, on one side, the solitary wasp. On the other side, the social wasp. Uh, solitary wasp with all, with all the spectrums of the possible in between. Uh, solitary wasps typically uh, hunt uh, other arthropods or other insects, build their nest, uh, lay an egg, close it, and go about building another one. Um, and as opposed to the social species, uh, which are characterized by an overlap of generation on the same nest, uh, communal care of the brood, and also caste division of labor, i.e. there is a hierarchy defined in the nest. Now, for obvious reasons, I've uh, sort of specialized or concentrated myself on the solitary wasps because the, the social wasps, the hornets and the rest, tend to be extremely aggressive and I'm a little bit tired of getting uh, stung. Uh, and I actually nearly, uh, nearly died, uh, laughing, but I nearly died in the Amazon, uh, getting stung on the, on the back of my head, and I turned into an athletic shock. Uh, and I was uh, two hours away from any clinic. Uh, I was basically dying. And luckily, my boatman or my guide uh, managed to get me there, and I got my two shots on the back of my feet. So basically, social wasps are very, very interesting because they learn, we can teach, we can learn from them a lot about mechanism of sociality, but they're extremely annoying. They, they do sting. Um, nesting behavior of uh, solitary wasps is basically the essence of their life. I mean, they spend all their time basically devoting their energy to the survival of their own species. And here we have a common local species called Isodontia diodon. Uh, forget about the name. Uh, only that diodon means two teeth. It has particular mandibles, which allows her to use particular material, which is, in this case, uh, the material which is here, uh, which divides the cell, which is actually plant, hair, plant material. So this is a typical nest. Uh, these wasps uh, generally use pre-existing cavities, uh, generally made by other arthropods, other insects. In this case, it's bamboo tubes, which I put in my garden uh, as traps. Basically, I used to I trap them so I can open it and basically dissect the nest and count what's going on in there and understand what's happening. And we have here a typical layout. Unfortunately, the picture is not too good. Uh, basically, we've got a series of cells, uh, all divided by a partition made out here of plant material. The cell is mass provisioned with cockroaches. An egg is laid on it, the nest is se sealed, and the wasp goes about her own business. Now, I've calculated wasps can have a huge, huge impact on their uh, environment. I mean, for instance, this wasp and its offsprings, for over, over the four generations that has over a year, uh, can actually consume 17 kilos of cockroaches, which is a huge amount of cockroaches when you think that there might be thousands of wasps running around, okay? So it's a big quantity. Uh, <laughs> well, you, you like getting rid of cockroaches. Well, <laughs> ask the cockroach, you might not like it. Um, the, uh, the fact is, in my, in my observation, uh, despite all the efforts of the mother to keep uh, generations of wasps going, uh, there is parasitism, which is pre prevalent. Basically, uh, it's in every single cell, in every single cell, uh, uh, nest that I've opened, there was very often parasites. Uh, but obviously, wasps have developed uh, uh, techniques to uh, uh, defend themselves from parasites. And in, in this case, I'll show you a, a typical, another typical wasp. And these ones actually nest in my office, I mean, in, in, in vast quantities. Uh, and they, it actually uh, stores its cells with uh, spiders. And you often find, and I often find, this little tiny fly that managed to penetrate the nest and basically wreak, wreak havoc inside, destroying not only the egg, but laying its own eggs inside, and basically the uh, magus hatch and eat the brood and eat all that is inside the nest, destroying entirely the, uh, the wasp nest originally. Um, now, as I said, wasps have developed mechanism, and it's very important that parasitism, parasitism is actually has an influence on the behavior of wasps, and they've developed techniques to defend themselves, one of which, one of which is basically cell architecture. Uh, all, all cells are closed by a partition. Generally, it could be a hard partition, which will avoid penetration by uh, pre predators. There's sometimes um, uh, cellular um, uh, vestibular cells um, sorry, I'm getting a little bit thirsty here. I'd like some water if there is any somewhere. Um, uh, basically, vestibular cells, which are empty cells, which are now basically or uh, confused of would be pre uh, would be parasite. Uh, th thirdly, we have. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, um, use of chemical repellents that permit basically uh, to avoid penetration of, of, of parasites. There's also there is also active defense by the wasp itself, i.e. Uh, she will, when she's building the nest, actively 
chase away uh, all penetrating uh, uh, um, parasites. And lastly, uh, I would like to talk about um, associates. This is what interests me particularly with wasp, is the association of wasp with other f living forms, uh, which permits basically a continuity of life. And uh, in this case, I will show you the example of this particular uh, potter wasp. The potter wasp, because it belongs to the family, although it doesn't make any pots, uh, it just lives in bamboos, as, uh, as I said previously. Um, and it's a common wasp locally. Every nest that I've opened, uh, these are basically the prey, in this case, uh, caterpillars. Every nest contains these little white organisms, which are actually tiny little mites, which at first feed on the uh, caterpillars without actually eating completely the caterpillars. Just eat a little bit, just to keep alive. And when, when, when the, the wasp grub is big enough, they start feeding on the wasp grub itself without killing it either. They just suck a little bit of juice, you know, give me a bit of that and I'll give you a bit of that too. And uh, it, it, it'll actually lay its eggs. You can see some eggs here. This is a female, a gravid female uh, mite, and here is a male running about. Now, the wasps have developed amazing association with these particular bugs or these particular mites uh, and developed special structures on their body to carry these mites from one nest to another. And you can see here uh, a pupae, i.e. a wasp, which is about to emerge, become an adult, and with its charge or its load of little bugs, little mites, which she will carry to the nest nest and basically uh, continue the cycle. It has been demonstrated that these guys are actually active defenses of the nest. They actually attack any parasite that try to get inside the nest and destroy them. So there is a mutual benefit between the two. And that's how symbiosis is defined. Symbiosis is actually defined as the physical contact of two organisms within the same environment, generally with mutualistic uh, benefits for one another. Sometimes there are relationships, and we don't know, we don't understand the mechanism, so we don't call them symbiotic, but most relationships on this planet can be called as symbiotic. I mean, just take, for example, the fact that on our body, we, felt, we feel so proud about our individuality, our body, but it's actually the home of an incredible array of interactions. It is estimated that it there are more bacteria on and in our body than cells that form it. So what am I really? Am I a human being or am I a bacteria? I mean, I, I actually, when you look at it that way, you don't really know. Uh, and it, the, the reality is, it's actually fundamental science. Uh, Lynn Margulis, uh, which is an a, um, a, um, American biologist, uh, uh, demonstrated beautifully about 30 years ago that uh, the bodies which are inside the cells, actually the non-nuclear bodies like the mitochondria or the chloroplasts in plants, are actually have a, a symbiotic origin. They are primeval bacteria that somehow manage to penetrate primeval cells, find their home there, and develop. And without mitochondria on our cells, we would not be able to transform, uh, have energy. Without chloroplast in plant cells, there'll be no photosynthesis. So basically, symbiosis is extremely important. Uh, on, the plan on the planetary level, James, oh shit, uh, on the planetary level, uh, James Lovelock, uh, a British scientist, uh, also developed a I would say a planetary uh, uh, theory called Gaia, Gaia the ancient Greek, Greek, uh, Greek goddess of Earth, whereby uh, the planet Earth is actually a macro-organism where atmosphere, lithosphere, and biosphere all contribute together to sustain life on the planet. So the emerging of these two theories, the symbiotic theory of the origin of life plus the Gaia theory brings absolutely interesting and beautiful, meaningful insights on what life and interaction of organisms are on this planet. So, as I said earlier, we as human, how do we define ourselves? How do we fit? Uh, are we, my, my, my body, my uniqueness, my the me, the notion of individuality, is actually more we. We are, I am we, and it's without the other, I do not survive. And our uh, sort of anthropocentric vision that was basically carried through by 2,000 years of Judeo-Christianism seems to be completely wrong. And we are probably more a little thing running around the planet uh, with basically a very, we are a very small part of the sum of all. And our importance, I believe, is not that great. And I would just like to conclude by, the, by thinking about this recent film uh, mentioned earlier, Avatar, where the fiction of Pandora, where every single organism is uh, interlinked by a net neuronal network, well, actually, this fiction might apply to us very, very precisely to this planet. And if we are to survive beyond the age of our industrial age, it may be time for us to heed to this notion of oneness. We are 
basically part of the system. We are not outside the system. We are not at the center of the system. And we're just a small element. And we need to understand that, see if we want to survive. Thank you.